Hello and welcome to webinar number five in this series of five webinars. I hope you're well. Uh, I hope so far that you've got a lot of content, a lot of, a lot of value, a lot of information that you can actually go out there and apply to your property business. So this is number five. Um, I reckon you've probably had, as a conservative estimate, well over 50 or 60 leads from the, from the different sources that we've talked about, but also that you've found uh, nuggets of information and ways of approaching your property business and, and um, implementing your property business that previously you wouldn't have thought of. Huge amount of content in, in the time that we've spent together, but also a huge amount of work for, for, for you to then do outside of listening to the webinars. You obviously know that you've always got these webinars to go back to. So um, if you, in, in a couple of months time, if you need a refresh, you can come back, you can have a look at this webinar again, and you can uh, remind yourself of some of the tips and techniques. Because when you're starting your business, if you are, if that's the place that you're in, some of the things might be very relevant to you right now. But in three or four months time, when, you're, when your business has grown, you might need to go on to that next level. And some of the information in here you might have discounted right now because it's not right for you. It's a little bit advanced. But then when you go on to that next level, watch the webinars again. Take in, take other pieces of advice, other topics, and then apply them when they're right to apply. So without further ado, let's crack on. So as you know, as you should know by now, I'm Chris Kirkwood. I am the Training and Development Director here at Sourced. There's some contact details at the bottom. And as you, as you well know, we've got four different parts of the business. Now, what we're going to talk about today is investor lead generation. This is obviously something that we train our franchisees to do um, because even if, they're, even if they're not looking to um, sell a deal to an investor, if they want to um, execute on that deal, they might need exchange money, they might need uh, uh, refurbishment money, there's a number of different ways in which a, a, an investor could come into a deal and help the franchisee facilitate that deal, which ultimately means that that, that franchisee is going to make money out of that deal. So we're going to look at how to, how to encourage these leads into, into you, how to encourage, how to build your audience of investors. So let's have a look at that now. So like I said, this is the last one of the five day series. So on the, the first day we had uh, secrets of online source and then commercial to residential on the second day. Third day was direct to vendor leads. Fourth day, packaging your deals, how to present them to investors. And then today we're gonna look at lead generation. In, and, and what we're gonna talk about today is not just, um, not just putting a deal, but packaging the deal like we talked about yesterday and throwing it out in front of one or two people. What we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about Putting, putting that deal, presenting that deal in front of as many people as possible and then converting those leads. And how can you then take that lead and build a relationship from that lead instead of just looking at everything as a one-off? What we're going to try and do is get momentum in your, um, in your sourcing business. Because as we talked about on, on one of the first two days, property sourcing or, or making money out of property at the very beginning when you are looking at sourcing, it's about a couple of things. It's about of uh, getting uh, property leads, and doing your due diligence on the property leads, getting investor leads and doing your due diligence on the investor leads, and then finally marrying those two, those two avenues up and selling some of those properties that you find to some of the investors that you find. Pretty straightforward. But the investors are obviously a very important part of that equation. So first of all, let's talk about what a quality lead is, because um, you could probably go onto some social media channels and you could put out there that you're looking for, you're looking for leads. And a number of people will come back to you and say, yeah, I've got leads, you can buy leads from me there, whatever, whatever the price is. Now, how that lead has come to that person determines the quality of that lead. If that person has just got contact details from, from the air quotes lead, then um, is it really a lead? I'm not so sure. The way that we see leads here at Sourced is we want our leads to have actively chosen to um, get more information about a specific topic. And that specific topic could be a property that you're, you're marketing. It could be something else. But that is a lead. They need to have actively chosen to get more information or, um, or to get put in touch with the person that is marketing that deal. Now, as it happens here at Source, we actually do it twice. So um, we, uh, in order for people to come onto our mailing list, 
they need to first of all choose to be on our mailing list and they'll be aware of all the things that are on our uh, on our mailing list and the, the amount of value that they can get from our mailing list and then when they're on our mailing list they might see a, a deal from one of our franchisees and so the from being on our mailing list they will then choose again they will then tap actively make a, a take action to get more information about that property deal so not only have they chosen to be on our mailing list in the first place they will then have chosen to get information about that property which means that they've actively taken um, taken action twice so our leads are uh, pretty well qualified considering we've got no no individual at that at that stage picking up the phone having a conversation with them they've already had to do two things in order to get through to this place so now that they're now they're through to the franchisee we put that lead straight through to the franchisee because they've expressed an interest in that property and what that means is the franchisee knows that a they're interested in specifically that property and b they're interested right now and they know the area so fantastic information for uh, starting a conversation with a property lead so the leads like i say they come in they go through a qualifying process and our qualifying process is that they have to take action a couple of times but then but then what happens when when they come through to the franchisee so when a franchisee puts a property out there um they could expect to generate somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 leads from putting one property out to the marketing list so the franchisee would then have to go through the process of uh, taking their due diligence on those leads to the next step and they would do that by having conversations with all of the leads so let's talk about that now um i think i'll cover it a little bit later but i i I'm enthused to talk about it now because it's something that really I, I, I like to pay a lot of attention to in my training and I don't think other people spend as, as much time on this as they should. This is a very important topic. How do you then converse with those leads? Well, the first thing that I would say is when I, uh, when I first start talking about investor leads, most people get a little bit scared. They get scared because they see that that investor lead, potentially with 100,000 pounds in their pocket, holds all of the power in that deal and so immediately they, they uh, adopt this very subservient way of trying to talk to an investor lead now i'm here to tell you that that's just not the case if you've got a good property deal finding the money for that good property deal will not be too difficult finding good property deals is much more difficult so if you've got a good property deal you're the person that is in charge you're the person that has got the scarcity that the other side uh, would value. So you need to first of all realize that there's a, there's a power shift. And just because the other person has the money doesn't mean that they've got all the power. You've got access to the property and you could go anywhere to find that money. They've got access to the money, but they couldn't go anywhere to find that property because you've got control over the property. And so therefore, you need to first of all realize that it's a very it's a very level conversation when you're first starting off you don't need to be subservient you don't need to uh, see the other side as the powerful side now that's at the very beginning of making contact with somebody that's that's going to be a lead I, I also want you to think about how you develop that relationship with that person because with the people that i trained we'd look at what else can you do it's a common question that i ask them um, whenever they come up, up come up against an issue or whether they have a problem that needs to be solved or they're looking to really um, stand out in their marketplace and compared to everybody else what else can you do so when leads come into their in into our our franchisees they'll first of all as i talked about yesterday start to build rapport they'll build rapport with a franchisee uh, with, with the lead sorry and then after an, uh, an initial rapport building phase they'll then start asking some questions about what they're looking for. Now, I wanna uh, make a distinction here between the people that I train and how most sources in the market would ask these questions. So first of all, I'm gonna give you the example of what sources in the market would say. So if they get a, pro get a property lead, they'll pick up the phone and they'll say, You're, you've expressed an interest in, the in this property. Um, this property's gone, so, um, what what you know i've got something else that's very similar can i can i show you that and the uh, the the lead would say 
Probably yes. Um, and at that point, the sourcer might say, is it HMOs that you're interested in? And the lead would say, probably yes. And that would be the end of the, of the due diligence process from that sourcer to that lead. And that's from somebody who is subservient in that relationship. Now, that's a nonsense way to find out information. First of all, there was no rapport build. And then secondly, you didn't get to the, the real crux of what that person's looking for. Now, with the people that I train, the most common question that I'll get them to ask is why? So initially, let's say that the scenario is similar where the property's already been sold to somebody else. And I would encourage the person that I'm training to say, that property's, uh, that property's gone now, I'm afraid. However, what was it about that property that really interested you? And you've le left an open question there for that person to tell you exactly what was, what was interesting to them. And what I would then do is, because you've already built rapport, is I would then challenge that person on what they think they want to achieve. Because I know from experience that the majority of leads that come through are from people who think they want HMOs and think they want HMOs in the North. Because they might have been on a training course, they might have read an article, they might have done one thing that tells them that HMOs in the North not only get you capital uplift, but also will get you a great rental income. Now, I'm not saying that that isn't true, because it is true in some cases, depending on the property. But understanding what that person, what that leads version of success and failure is, will also open you up to different strategies, because your knowledge of property is based on contracts and finance. And so you could go into any property strategy and you could apply what you know of contracts and finance to make a, make a success of that property strategy. So I would say to that person, so you're, you, you, want to, you want to do HMOs in the North. Tell me, why is, it, why is it you want to do HMOs in the North? Why is it you've picked specifically that strategy? And again, an open question. Get them telling you all about themselves. People love to talk about themselves. And not only are you finding out fantastic information at this point, but you're also building rapport with them. Now, at that point when you've gathered as much information as you feel like you can, that's the point that you would start to challenge them. And at that point, I would start saying something like, so you're, you think that uh, your version of success is a 10% return on capital employed. What if I could get you a 20% return on capital employed, but, we, but by applying a different strategy? Would you be interested in that? Because essentially what we're doing here is we're taking it back to the numbers that actually matter. And remember when we went through the numbers, we were talking about, talking, talking about return on capital employed as the main metric. Now they might come to you initially and because they've done this one course on HMOs, they might see that as the metric and they might come to you and say, I want HMOs in the North because that's what they think will get them success. And it's not. You know that. I know that. The other sourcer might not know that because what you need to focus on are the things that matter. So return on capital employed. So if you're, if you're waiting for a 10% return on capital employed, which by the way is, is terrible, but I have heard people come into the marketplace as new leads asking for as little as an 8% return on capital employed, because what they're looking at is they're looking at how that 8% compares to all, how their money's performing in all the other investment classes. And 8% is like double. And so they would be happy with 8%. Now, as that person spends more time in property, that percentage might go up and up and up. However, when they first came into property, they were happy with an 8% return on capital employed. Now, at that point you say, okay, <clears throat> I've, got a I've got a couple of different strategies here. I've got a flip and that flip, as, as we were talking about the other day, that flip is gonna produce a 60% return on capital employed. Would you be interested in that one? It's a very straightforward deal. And then you can go into the, remember when we were talking about packaging yesterday, the high level numbers, that, that paragraph at the very beginning, you can go into those details. Now, at that point, they're probably going to say yes. I'd say 95, 99% of people are gonna say yes, that they are interested in that because you've just multiplied by six what they can achieve in the same amount of time. However, somebody's gonna say no. At some point, somebody will say no. And at that point, you need to dig into why why they've said no, what is their driving factor? What is making their decision for them? Because it's only when you understand that, that you can then take the relationship onto the next level. Now, what do I mean by taking the relationship onto the next level? Because you've just completely over-delivered in comparison to everybody else that's out there in the property world that's trying to help that person. 
what can you do? What can you do that's even more? Where, what else can you do? So at that point, I would sit that person down for a coffee and I would say, this is how I would take it to the next level. I would say, this is your situation. This is how much money you have. This is what you want to achieve. Let's make a plan now based on all of those criteria for how we can achieve that for you and perhaps even achieve more in the same amount of time. How does that sound? Now, they're obviously going to be really interested. And again, all you're doing is making sure that that person stays loyal to you because you're solving problems that other people, other sources aren't even addressing. That is what I mean by building a relationship with a lead. I see a lot of people claim that they're building relationships with leads, but they don't ask the difficult questions. They don't go, they don't make that plan that answers questions that that person didn't even know they had at the start of their relationship. What you're doing at this stage is using your knowledge to apply for that person to A, educate them, but B, come up with a plan that potentially they couldn't have done themselves. Now, what do you think their opinion of you is going to be when you've been through that process? They're going to think you're pretty terrific, right? And even if somebody else, another sourcer came up to them and tried to give them the best deal in the world, they might at that point turn around and say, no, I'm working exclusively with this guy because this guy understands everything about what I'm trying to achieve in property. It's not just a one hit wonder that you're trying to achieve by get, selling me this one deal. Does that make sense? That's a relationship with a lead. So understanding that, <clears throat> looking back at the slide, understanding that will get you more conversion, more sales. And not only do I always ask people, you know, what else can you do? But something else, one of my other sayings that I recycle time and time again is something that I've just forgotten. So no, not only what else can you do, but it's all about lifetime value. Lifetime value. You should be entering every single relationship with lifetime value on your mind. So with that in mind and understanding what you're supposed to be doing with leads once you get them, let's have a look at some of the ways that we generate leads, uh, whether they're successful, the rough costs, and um, some of the pros and cons that are associated with those leads. So the first one that we're going to look at is Facebook ads. Now, Facebook ads we've used, uh, we've used in the past, and Facebook is obviously a very popular platform, right? And it has a lot of people that go on there. Now, if you're going to put an ad on Facebook, the likelihood of having a lot of people see that ad is very, very good. So it gets you really good exposure. It also allows very detailed targeting by interests, demographics, and, and so on and so forth, like we talked about when we were doing direct to vendor leads. You can get into the real nitty gritty. You could, you could choose to put a Facebook ad in, some, in front of only people that have liked the Jeremy Carl show, show, for example. That's how detailed you can be with Facebook ads. Now, one of the things, uh, some of the bad things about Facebook is it re would requ require a lot of testing to find out exactly how uh, the best way for you to reach your audience. Now, we've been through hours and hours and hours and spent a lot of money on testing Facebook ads. Um, and so we've been through that process. And for some markets, Facebook and Facebook ad generation just doesn't work because the quality of the ad isn't there. But for other markets, it's absolutely perfect. I'd say one of the other negatives about Facebook ads is you don't necessarily have to have searched for property to be shown property adverts. So people that could, um, if you're going to put a generic ad out there, um, like if you compare them, let's say with Google ads, with Google ads, you search for a certain keyword and then you'll be so shown ads that are based around that keyword. Facebook doesn't operate the same way because it doesn't have the same search functionality or it's not based on the search. Facebook is based more on uh, your page and what you're doing around your page. So that's the first thing that we'd say about Facebook ads. Cost can really vary, and this depends completely on how good you are at um, targeting those ads and getting those costs down. Now, like I said, I think yesterday or the day before, this could be a topic all on its own, and this could take a, you know, a couple of days worth of explaining on how to structure your Facebook ads. If you can get them fairly cheap, then they might well be worth testing. If they come through at 50 quid a lead, there are lots of other ways that you can 
um, that you can generate leads for yourself without spending that amount of money. But certainly, first of all, when, if we're looking for volume of ads, if we're looking for a lot in order to test out what we're doing, Facebook ads would definitely be one of the first places that we're going because the volume is definitely there. The quality, in order to get that quality, it takes a lot of testing and a lot of changing things around. Social media. So we're on Facebook ads. So the social, the, the Facebook ads we're going to take as the paid for class. Social media, we're going to talk about your social media profiles. Now this is something that we have this is something that we have a battle with on most training sessions for me because a lot of people are sort of scared of, of, of employing social media for, uh, for their property business. So I have built uh, quite a lot of people that follow me on social media. I post quite a lot on social media. And the reason for that is I'm trying to put content out there to build a community for people to come to me with, if they've got questions about property, I'm happy to answer those questions about property. But I'm trying to build a community by putting a lot of information out there based on social media. Now, if at some point I needed to sell a house, I would put it on social media because I know that I'm, uh, I've got the attention of people who are in property that they might be able to buy the house from me or they might know somebody who wants to buy that house. So it's just about um, uh, raising your profile in the, in the circle in which you want to operate. I think that's the best way of putting it. Now, how you do that is you document and you put content out there. That's pretty much it. Document what you're doing, because if you're out in property, you're probably going to viewings, you're probably helping people, you're probably sitting down and having coffees with people, you're probably going to networking events, so document everything that you're doing. And then with the content, write down what you've learned from documenting what you've been doing. It's, it's, really, it's really that simple. Anybody that complicates it any more than that is probably complicating it unnecessarily. Show people what you're doing. They'll follow you because in most cases, the people that follow you will want to be doing what you're doing. If you're going on a property viewing at three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon and they're stuck at work, they're gonna to want to do what you're doing because they're stuck at work and you're, you're taking control of your time and choosing what you're gonna do and moving your property business forward. Now, before you get any kind of con uh, conversion from, from social media, it is going to take quite a long time. I think it took me something like <clears throat> 12 months to go from maybe 284 friends on Facebook up to, uh, I think it was about three and a half thousand. Uh, it took me about 12 months to get to that point. And nobody, I didn't add anybody uh, during that time. It was all about me just going out there, showing people what I was doing, putting the content out and having people come to me and want to follow me. So I've got, right now, I think I'm just under 5,000 people on Facebook. Uh, I've got a few thousand people on LinkedIn, and I'm looking at YouTube and Instagram at the moment as the next potential platforms for growth while still growing these other two channels. So it's taken me a long time to get to that three and a half thousand in order to then uh, potentially get any kind of conversion from that. But as we talked about with direct vendor leads as well, um, direct to vendor uh, was up applied by one of my friends who used Facebook and said, look, I'm, I'm helping people who want to sell, who need to sell houses, but they're having trouble. If you've got, if you know anyone, come to me. And he made 20,000 pounds from that one Facebook post. So Facebook, social media in general, I think you would only um, ignore the opportunities that social media can give you at your peril. It's the way that, the, the, that people communicate now and it should be uh, adopted as part of your strategy for not only in investor leads, but also property leads. And that's the best thing, right? Cost is free. Not only the cost for the platform is free, but if you're, if you're documenting and you're showing people the content that you've, you've learned from documenting, you're doing it anyway. It's not as if you have to go out and you know, drive to the other side of the country and, and create this content. You're doing this anyway. And so all it takes is for you to pull your phone out, spend a couple of minutes creating a post, maybe do a Facebook Live, um, and, then, and then you're done. It's taken maximum five, 10 minutes of your day to create three different posts. And those three different posts are gonna gradually get your attention and, uh, 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 and have those people follow you. Another thing that we need to talk about is groups. Um, and obviously what you would do is you would go into Facebook groups and you would 
post your content in there because if you're if you're going into a group you know that the, all the people in that group might be interested in property already <clears throat> and if if like me you had 284 friends at the beginning you can go into a group that has 20,000 and all of a sudden you've got the exposure of 20,000 not just the 284 that you've got in your on your personal friends list so a couple of really really good tips there like I said like I think for everything really we could spend a couple of days talking about social media when I in our five-day training here at Sourced um, I spend about three hours talking about social media and what the benefits of social media are and how what what social media has done for me um, over the past couple of years so it's something that should be ignored at your peril and also it's worth worth mentioning at this point that we also talk about mindset quite a lot and it's funny how uh, people putting them out set out there on social media will quite frequently link back to the mindset and what the mind what their mindset is and what in their mindset is holding them back from putting themselves out on social media uh, other online advertising so you can decide who your ad shown to where your ad shown you've got a lot of say over uh, uh, over where the advert goes in order to build your audiences and it but again when you get into this sort of level, um, it can become very tricky. And so you would need, you would probably need somebody's help. Now there are a lot of people out there. You might know somebody as a friend who can uh, potentially help you look into this. Um, but if you haven't, then it can be, um, it can become quite time consuming and also expensive. I think this kind of advertising is, is the, the modern version of, you know, old print advertising because newspapers were, were always very expensive. Online advertising like this is, I think, equivalent to newspapers when you look at the, the exposure and the reach that you get from them. Could be, um, could be very targeted, might not be, depends on the platform. You'd have to assess each one individually, but it's worth looking at. I mean, we have tried, we have tested some of this. I mean, as you probably gathered by now after these five days that we spend a lot of time testing things to see whether they work. And if they work, we carry on with them. And if they don't, we, we look at other ways of, of doing, achieving the same result in a more efficient manner. Relationship building. So we've talked about this quite a lot when it, when it comes to a lead coming in. Um, and we've talked about sort of building a community on Facebook, but relationship building could also be seen as estate agents uh, or, or, or uh, people that you meet at networking events, or like we talked about in direct vendor leads, surveyors solicitors um, and anybody else that you're meeting on a regular basis you should make sure that everybody that you're around understands what you're trying to do in property what you're looking for and how you can help them help their customers for example so we built relationships with local councils um, the, because we get planning leads that come into our come into our network um, as part of uh, the benefits of being being part of sourced now in terms of building relationships, um, I sold a property in Morecambe a little while ago uh, for £4,000. It was £55,000 sale, £4,000 sourcing fee. And I actually had the, the empty homes officer from Morecambe City Council um, doing the viewings for me because Morecambe's about an hour and a half away from me and I didn't want to keep going up there to do the viewing. So I, I called her. It was in her interest to, to, do, to do something like this. But now I'm in touch with her pretty regularly. And um, that property sold. We don't have any any sort of uh, anything to work on together. But I went through that process of, um, you know, building rapport with her, uh, continually being in touch, seeing if there was any ways that I could help her achieve her achieve her targets to make her life easier. Building that relationship with her. So me and her, her name's Claire, uh, me and her email fairly regularly um, in order to see, you know, what's going on and see if I can help her or she can help me. That's all about relationship building. It's all about having touch points with people and then and then continuing those touch points because it might be the case that with Claire I might be able to help her out in five years time but because of the life we've looked at that relationship as a lifetime value relationship it doesn't matter that nothing's going to happen between now and then but I'll keep her she she could be very useful for me and I could be very useful for her so we'll stay in touch in order to make sure that um, that if there is anything that we can do in the future that we're there to do it And there you go, you know, not only between me and Claire could, could something, could something um, be useful for us, but also it might be somebody that I know that wants to, wants to invest in Morecambe, or she might know somebody that's got a property somewhere else that, that she needs my help with. 
Now it can be consuming, um, so you've got to look to make it as efficient as possible. And also, when it comes to this this kind of co communication, a lot of people might just be tire kickers. A lot a lot of people would talk a good game, but not actually commit when it comes to the time of committing. And so having the ability to identify them is something that will come with experience. So yeah, the monthly cost goes from free to say a hundred quid. And that hundred quid is really on the coffees and those, those little meetings or driving around uh, uh, meeting people. So um, I try and keep mine on email and just have a, have a list of people that I always want to keep in touch with. Um, and that's the, that's the, the most efficient way that I can do it. And then if that needs to go to the next level, we can then look at having a coffee together or then, then take it to the, to the point where we're spending money. Uh, print media. So we talked about leaflets a little bit with uh, direct to vendor. Um, advertorials, billboards. So up here, you can see these are, the, um, these are the, the hoardings for our Regent Plaza development. So that's where the 500 uh, plus flats are being built in Manchester. And these are the hoardings that we've got around the outside. So around the outside, we're talking about our development side of the business. And then up here, we're talking about the, um, the capital side of the business and the return that people can get from investing in some of our franchisees deals. So we're cross, cross branding right there. But you've also got investment guides. Uh, we produce quite a lot of uh, strategy specific documents for our franchisees. Um, and we also help them with, with um, fast sale leaflets, whatever they're trying to achieve. Um, if, it, if it's the benefit of all the franchisees, we can produce documents to help them out with that kind of thing, which takes a lot of cost away from them. Um, it gives good brand awareness. And if you get it done properly, that brand can be remembered by the people that it touches. And it is difficult to quantify results because, because say with leaflets, um, you've got to know who's contacted you from that leaflet. Now, and it's difficult because I once employed a, a company to deliver 10,000 leaflets for me as a test. And I had another company deliver 10,000 leaflets for me in the same area, um, but different leaflets. Same thing, talking about the same sort of thing, but different leaflets. And from the when the company delivered, they did, they did all kinds of, um, um, uh, what's the word, like registers to, to make sure that I knew that those leaflets were being delivered. So for every, say, 50 people or 50 households that the leaflet went to, they'd knock on a door and get somebody to sign to say that they'd received the leaflet. So I had loads of names and, and, and telephone numbers of people that had received the, the, the leaflet. And they were a very professional company. They were very expensive. So for those 10,000 leaflets, I got loads of names of people that had, had received the leaflets, but not a single phone call. I used a local guy for the other 10,000 leaflets. And for the, for the other 10,000 leaflets, he just did them himself. He didn't take any records. And I got something like 40 or 50 phone calls from him doing it. And they were both, both sets of leaflets were delivered in a stack of five. So the, the testing conditions were very, very fair. But the second guy, even though I didn't have all of that, all of that documentation, the results I got were far better. But if you were to look at, the, look at both of them, you'd say that the, the documentation that I got from the very professional, a very expensive company would have been better. It's a very hard thing to quantify. I think if I was going to do leaflets again, and I'm currently not, I would go to the to the, the little local guy who who I was getting the better results for because from because it's all about conversion, right? You can go to trade shows. So if you've been to the property investors trade show or something like that, they're all over the place at the moment. I think there's actually one at the moment, one quite close to here, uh, as in the the date. I think there's one in Olympia at some point soon. Uh, we tend to go to the um, the property investor show at the XL. They have one in October and one in April, uh, and we basically do that for our franchisees. We don't do it for for, for sourced HQ. We don't really get much of a benefit from it, but our franchisees have the opportunity to talk to investors because there's lots of investors that go there, and we've had people that have given us properties at the at the trade show. We've had people that have registered to invest um, in, in franchisees deals. We've had lots and lots of interest. And I know some of the franchisees have then taken those contacts and taken them and made, made money from selling, selling properties to those people. If you were just the one man band, it is a difficult thing to go to a trade show and look impressive because um, it costs thousands and thousands of pounds to put these stalls together. 
Uh, our stall is pretty big. I think that's actually four, four, the, the, four times the size of a normal stall. Um, but the stalls are very, very big. So if you've got the backup of a support and marketing team, I would definitely look at it. If you haven't, it can become quite expensive. Cost over a thousand pounds, but that's, I mean, that's for a very small store. So just bear that in mind. Webinars like we're talking about now. And there's me sitting on the sofa that I'm looking at right now. Uh, now what the webinars can do obviously is bring people into your world. They can hopefully like you have this week is you, you can see some of the value that we're putting out there. You can see the depth of knowledge that we have on a, on a certain subject. And then you can watch that webinar, but also you will, like I said at the beginning of this one, you've got access to that webinar time and time again. So you know that there's value and content in that webinar. You can save that to your, to your computer, which means that my brand gets exposed, exposure every single time that you look at the webinar that we've done. Cost can be from zero to 100 pounds. I think the, the only cost that we have in our webinar, well, apart from the, uh, the radio mic thing that I'm wearing on my head, is uh, the software that we use. And that's not a huge amount of money. But if you wanted to do that, of course, the cost, the actual cost of the webinar would be getting the audience together to, uh, to then watch the webinar. Because there's no point in getting everything together and then putting a webinar on and you don't get, nobody watches it because you haven't, you haven't taken your time to do the marketing in order to build, in order to get people in to actually watch the webinar. And for this series of five over these days, we've had hundreds of people register which is really exciting, it's really good. I'm really pleased that we're able to help out that many people with the content. That we're doing. Hosting events, so earlier this year we put on a golf day and there's my um, golf tutor, Damon. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really pleased it's his picture on there because at this, at this hole, uh, we had to do a closer to the pin challenge and we had to try and beat the pro. Uh, I've had 13 golf lessons now, all from Damon. And he hit the ball within six feet of the hole, uh, which was a, obviously just a par three. And I hit it within five feet of the hole. So I actually beat him. It's the only time I've ever beaten him. But I'm really pleased that this, this is on here because it brings back a really good, uh, really good day that we had. So if we put, get people interested in something, like, in something like golf days, what golf does especially, and there are other things. I'm not saying golf is the only thing. But we, we're talking about hosting events. But it puts you in touch with that person. And from day one, we've said that the way that you make, you, uh, you make progress in property is by building relationships. It's about human contact. And so if you can find a similarity that you have with somebody and you can host one of those days, you can, golf is great for this because you're gonna spend four or five hours walking around, uh, in our case, beautiful Cheshire countryside, talking to those people. Now in my, in my uh, uh, group of four, there were, I was with three fantastically educated, um, property investors it was a really good time and then we had a great time and stayed in touch with them since then so hosting events finding similarities uh, with people in your um, in your world that you want to you want to take your relationship further events can be really good and it can be costly and it can't can require a lot of planning so the golf day was very expensive but it doesn't have to be as expensive as, as like a golf day it can be something something a bit cheaper So your existing database, a lot of people would come into property and they, um, they would have a database or they'd have a, a list of people. And what they would do is pretty much nothing unless they had something that they wanted to put out there. They had a property that they wanted to sell or they you know, uh, wanted to um, try, and, try and pitch something. Now that isn't nurturing, that's trying to pitch. Nurturing your database means, again, using the contacts there in order to put information out to grow the to grow the education to, to grow the what they think of you and show where your value is in uh, giving them that information so we have a number of we have a number of databases at source and we have email chains for every single one of these databases um, because each database will have a different interest and so each email chain talks about different things but I think earlier this year, 2019, we wrote something like 700 emails to go in each one of these, um, each one of these email workflows. And that's how we're nurturing that database because by the time we come to pitch that database, they'll have been through a series of like five, six, seven, eight emails, all giving them information, all increasing their, uh, their knowledge so that when we come to the time of pitching, they're more confident 
they're, they're more educated and they're more able to make a decision quickly to purchase whatever it is that we're, we're pitching to you. That makes sense, right? It's incredible how many people forget their database. Now you need to be aware a little bit of um, uh, technology here because we, uh, at one point we had people's uh, emails going into spam folders and we had to rejig, I'm not even gonna pretend I know why. Um, we have IT in our, an IT team here um, and they, they worked their magic and, and made, it, um, made it better again. I have not got that depth of knowledge when it comes to IT, but you need to be aware of things like that. <clears throat> And the cost really, the cost, the main cost for that is going to be your, your time because you're going to have to put all of these, all of these uh, emails together. So uh, website traffic inquiry forms. So if you've got a website and you've put uh, information on there or you put, uh, you know, download uh, our booklet, um, this can not only um, uh, put you in the right light because you're giving away free content, but again, You've got your branding out there. It's a beautiful document. People are judging you not only on the content of the document, but the way the document looks, how quickly you can get it across to them, and so on and so forth. Now, this will generate a lot of time wasters or a lot of people that have absolutely no intention in taking that relationship further. So having this as an automated process is a great, it is really the only way to do it because if this was taking you any time, then it's not gonna, it's not gonna um, generate the same kind of results as your time could in other in other for, in other ways of uh, of using that time. So cost, if you're going to do it as PDF, it doesn't have to be very expensive, and it can be all incorporated into the build of your website initially. So again, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, even if you're, we talked about five hundred people per hour and, and websites like that. If you're going to get somebody from there to build your website, and you've written your brief, you want your you, you know your your brief is very specific. Make sure you inc incorporate things like that in that brief keep your costs low. Landing pages, a landing page is, a, is basically a, a one page website, right? And you will drive traffic to that one page website. So if you put a post on Facebook um, or LinkedIn or uh, um, Instagram, and you said, if you want this document or if you want something, uh, register here. That would then take them through to this landing page. And this landing page would be designed in order to gather, get their information, um, to give them whatever you've said you're going to give them, or to register on whatever you said you're going to re register them on. And then you've got that information that you can then use to, to, to contact them or to pitch to them or whatever it is that you're going to do. You, need to, you obviously need to have thought about this process um, before you put all of this together. Uh, and like it says here, it's only part of the job because then you'll, uh, you'll have their information, but then you need to go and build that. Build that, uh, build that relationship with them on the, once they've registered, but in order you need to drive traffic to the landing page in the first place. So Facebook ads might cost you the money where it comes to, to, to landing pages. Um, going out there, if you've, got, if you've built a big community and you've, got, you've, re, you've reached your 5,000 friends limit on Facebook, um, you, know, you might be able to drive a lot of people there from your community, but you're gonna be looking at, at driving from as many different sources as you possibly can in order to get as many people hitting that landing page and putting their details down as you can. So the cost really, I think uh, ClickFunnels is something that we use. I think it costs 70 quid a month for us. Um, and the reason that it could, the cost could go from 70 to 1,000 is because of all that traffic driving that you've done at the front end in order to get as many people to that page as possible. <clears throat> and that's, that's basically it. I mean, that's, that is the sentence. How do you compete with everyone? There's so many people out there looking for investors. Your ability to form a relationship is critical. That's it. Now, if you need help at forming relationships, there's things you can do in order to, um, find, to help you find it easier to form relationships with people. If you can't go to networking events because you're absolutely petrified of standing there on, on your own without anybody talking to you. There's things you can do about that. It's all about being on the cause and effect, the right side of the cause and effect equation. Me, I'm on the cause side of the equation. I believe I cause everything that happens in my life. I'm not on the effect. I'm not the effect of things that happen in my life. And therefore, because I'm on the cause side, I will find a solution. If I'm standing on my own at a networking event, I'll go and talk to somebody. 
if there's something else that's holding me back, I'll find a solution for it. I am completely in control of all the things that I can do. If I had a problem with forming relationships with people, I would go and do something about it. In fact, I did do something about it a couple of years ago. I got trained on NLP. So I'm an NLP practitioner, which helps me um, understand other people and sort of read between the lines of the things that they're saying, read their body language, put all of that knowledge into place to take the relationship that I'm building with them to the next level. As I said, they want HMO in the North. So the real desire. So this is the slide that I was talking about earlier. But we've sort of covered this quite extensively. So you need to find out what their real desire is. And I think it would be, you need to be quite savvy about it as well. Because if they say, I want a HMO in the North, and you say, you just, you just um, counter that with, come on, no, what do you really want? Then actually you're being quite confrontational. What you need to do is you need to be a little bit more intelligent about the way that you address that problem. So first of all, you need to get them to be very, very specific. I want a HMO in the North. Yeah, what does that look like? I mean, what kind of return are you imagining that you're going to be able to get from a HMO in the North? Bearing in mind that you live in London, you know what the, you know what the returns in London are like. So what are you expecting from the North? Tell me. Um, and then taking that to the next level. It's all about asking questions, especially in that first stage. Ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, whenever, whenever people talk about investors, they always say, oh, but should I ask how much money they've got? And really, yeah, you should, but there's a, sh a, a shed load of questions that you need to ask before you get to that point. You need to know exactly what their desires are. You need to know exactly, exactly what motivates them. That's the important stuff, because the crappy sources out there are going to ask about the, uh, ask about the money, and then they're going to go away and they're going to try and find something for that money. But that money that the, that other sorcerer is going to be using is not addressing their desires and their motivation. That's what you're going to address. And that's why your relationship with that investor is so much stronger than the other sources. That's how you compete. You compete by it not being a competition at all because you're so much better than the other person. And don't forget the question why. Build that plan for them. And then you've just knocked it out of the park. As soon as you've put that plan together and potentially shown them how they can achieve even more money using your knowledge of contract, contracts and finance. You just knock that, knock that ball out of the park. So if you had a property deal to sell on and you were going to produce a brochure for 100 quid and a Facebook ad for 250 quid and then add consultant, if you wanted to uh, get to that point of being very efficient with your Facebook ads a lot quicker, CRM is going to cost you 20 quid, website, landing page, 200 quid, including the adverts that get, that, that get driven there. That could cost you from, from selling one deal about 870 quid. Quite a lot of money, right? Especially if you're charging a 2% sourcing fee on a property that's worth uh, 100,000 pounds. That's a lot of money gone. All of a sudden you need to sell almost twice as many properties in order to make the same amount of money that you were expecting to make just by selling them onto without this 870 pounds cost. So the alternative is with Sourced, we, uh, we take care of that for our franchisees. It's all part of being with Sourced. We charge a fee every single month as, being, uh, as, a, as a franchise fee. And all of this is included within that, uh, within that franchise fee. So we send them property leads, we send them investor leads, we manage their email campaigns, national brand marketing, regional blog, access to the peer-to-peer -peer platform if they want to fund their own deals, lots of different things. Now, from selling one deal, as we've just seen, it can cost about £870. Um, but we charge, as our ongoing fee, far, far, far less than that. Now, if you're interested in finding out, drop me a message or go onto the sourced website, sourcedfranchise.co, and you can requ request um, our download franchise prospectus from there. Uh, I'm saying that because I know it, it gets updated fairly regularly as things, as, as things change, as new deals get done, and so on and so forth. So if you go there and you download it, you'll get the most recent version of the prospectus. So now let's have a look at some of the projects. So don't forget, uh, through our capital brand, through the peer-to-peer -peer platform, we can fund 100%, 100% of franchisees' deals. And that's based on 70% of the GDP, like we talked about yesterday. Peer-to-peer, -peer, um, this is a property that's, that, that we covered on peer-to-peer. -peer, so 
that's the, the Crosby pub. That's, um, it was a pub and it's been turned into flats. And we funded that on our peer-to-peer -peer platform. So we've got two franchisees that are doing that project uh, right now. And that's the experience from, from one of the franchisees that is involved in that project. And here's a couple of others. Uh, so Everton is uh, based in Barnet, just north of London, and Everton got a serviced accommodation uh, deal, uh, which generated him something like £800 per calendar month on an average. Uh, now, what we were looking at for, these, for this deal, this is a rent-to-rent -rent deal. Now, when Everton came to us, we, we needed to do a couple of things. We needed to work on cash flow, and we needed to work on, uh, on making those big pots of money as well. So for cash flow, we were looking at serviced accommodation because it's, uh, it's pretty popular around where, where he's based. And then for the big pots of money, and, and we also, for cash flow, looked at sourcing deals. It just so happens that Everton's just sourced, uh, sourced a deal out to an investor as well. And then for the big pots of money, we're looking at refurbs and flips and that kind of thing. So that's, that was Everton's first deal that he, he got with us. Nadia, she's done an assisted sale. Uh, this assisted sale, she didn't have the money to, to put into the refurb project. So she, she found the assisted sale. She found an investor to put the money in. She's gone through that whole process where she sat in the middle and basically facilitated that deal. And she sold that with a profit of £35,000 for her and £35,000 for the investor. So the total profit was 70 grand uh, and it was a 50-50 split between her and the investor. None of her own money, 35 grand profit, which is pretty decent. And then we've got Angus who's in, in, uh, in Scotland and Angus worked one day a week in Sourced because he's got a, a job in finance. And Angus, uh, earlier in 2019, Angus had four separate flips going on, all through bridging, uh, being funded by bridging, um, all at the same time. And he managed that from one day a week. Angus's goals were pretty big. His, his expectation of himself was very high when he first came on with Source. We came up with a plan in order to get Angus to that point, and which he has absolutely nailed over, over the last year. And then the pub conversion that we've talked about. So it's going to be converted into nine apartments uh, and it was uh, an opportunity on the peer-to-peer -peer platform. So these guys put that opportunity on the peer-to-peer -peer platform and then investors were then uh, able to invest, put their money into this project and they'd make a 10 or 12 percent return on their money depending on how um, depending on how much they put into it. And that re return on their money uh, um, is secured against the property as well. So they've got the security of the first charge over that property for the money that they put into it. Now, how quickly you can earn depends on a lot of factors. Depends on if you've got any money in the bank to start off with. It depends on um, how much time you're going to put into it. It depends on whether you've got another job and so on and so forth. So that's completely up to you. But what we do is we sit down with every single one of our franchisees and we come up with a plan to take advantage of their situation, their financial situation, their personal situation, and we put a plan together help them achieve their goals so this is the end of the five webinar series it's been really it's been really pleasant spending this week with you thanks for all the questions i appreciate them um, if you've got anything that you want to ask please feel free in the normal way go to the facebook group 30 property uh, leads in in five days go to the facebook group ask in there you've got my email address it's written down in front of you right now if there's anything that i can do to help out please let me know um, if you want any details on the prospectus, you can either go to the website or you can send me a message and ask me, ask me about becoming a source franchisee. If you are just going to use this information for yourself and go out there and start your business, I'd love to hear about the progress that you're making. I'd love to hear about what you think about these five webinars. And coming up is going to be a quiz. So we're going to email out a quiz uh, based on everything that we've been through this week. And uh, I want to see how you do. I want to see how you score. Uh, I want to see how well I've trained, how well I've communicated this information. So we're coming up with 20 questions. They're multiple choice questions because that's everyone's favourite. And I want to see uh, how you do uh, on those questions. So look out for that. It'll land in your email uh, inbox very, very soon. So thanks very much for spending this week with me. It's been a pleasure. And um, hopefully I'll get to speak to you soon. Thanks very much. And good luck.